I like it here. I love the feeling of being an eagle above the valley. But more than that, I like being in Wales. Half my lifetime ago, the Times sent me here as its correspondent. It was a lovely job. I roamed where I wanted and wrote what I wished. And there was a lot to write about because it was a time of upheaval, political, industrial, and cultural. And after being a foreign correspondent in Wales, I went to live and work in India, America, Russia, and many other places. I don't think I'm sentimental about Wales, but it certainly got under my skin. A friend once said that Wales is a country of about the right size for a person to get to know well in one lifetime. So I've got a lot of catching up to do. Today I'm walking the Black Mountains, border country, not quite England, not quite Wales. What is this cross and why is it here? There's a story that a bishop preached right here in 1188 to raise troops for the Crusades. But it could have been carved by a pilgrim, for it's a Maltese cross, the Pilgrim's Cross. And this is a pilgrim's place. For many centuries, people have paused at this discreet little well at Patricio to leave a coin or a flower or a prayer. The pretty story of the well is that its waters cured a wealthy pilgrim of his leprosy and he gave a hat full of gold to found the church. I'm happy to believe it since my ten mile walk from Patricio to Capilafine threads its way along the boundary of history and myth. The countryside hereabouts is an oyster and the church at Patricio is its pearl. The remarkable treasure is the rood screen. 15th century, carved from oak, a rare survivor of the ravages of reformers who tore down these lovely things. It's unpainted and so fresh that you feel the woodcarver has just gone into the churchyard for a bite of lunch. The wicked dragon consumes the luscious vine, symbol of goodness, though in the end, goodness wins the day. On the walls are the admonitions that kept our ancestors on the straight and narrow, the Ten Commandments, the Royal Coat of Arms, and, you can't avoid seeing it as you leave, the Grim Reaper with his scythe, his hourglass to remind us that time is short, and his spade. An extraordinary family of craftsmen called Brute carved many of the memorial stones here and in other churches in the district. These cherubs are a marvel, so mischievous like larky choir boys with their centre partings, and they look ready to flap their wings and buzz the vicar. And the paintwork is a marvel too, very old but still gleaming. It's marvellous that the paint has survived for so many centuries. I think now um, nobody really knows how the pigments were mixed, but possibly the gold paint, maybe gold leaf. Um, I think nothing else would have lasted quite so long. During a sermon on sin, you could always look at these impish faces and think of the fun of life. It's a celebration that endures on the tombstones that Bridget Barnes had made for her parents. When she died, we rather wanted to follow on the tradition of having craftsmen doing tombstones and it has our house on it and some of our animals on it in fact the foal on it was my stallion when he was a baby <laughs> and there's a, there's a cow called Katrin on there and there's a line of ducks and a sheep dog that was called Moss and an artist's palette which, which he incorporated in the whole thing which was rather nice. And do you have any hopes or plans yourself in that direction? Well, I think, yes, I think I shall leave instructions to my niece. I would like to have a Welsh cob on mine, because I breed Welsh cobs, and possibly I'd have to have a sheep, because I look after sheep, and maybe a sheep dog as well. Without a sheep dog, you can't look after sheep. I can hardly hear myself think for the bird song. Across the meadow stands the home of a Tudor man of substance. 
the repair work is strictly controlled because it's a listed building. Modern craftsmen take over where their forefathers left off, following the old chisel marks. It's not the first time it's been restored. W.I.E., which is William John Evans, and C.W., which they think is either his wife or his son. In 1649, when it, the house was restored, and I.D. was a local builder. My family bought it in 1703, and they've been here ever since. The craftsmen here are in touch with history. The work is done under the eye of Cadu, the historic building's body. You can't restore it as you wish? Oh, no. Um, they tell us exactly what we have to do, such as the um, stone tiles have to be replaced on the roof. The stone flags on the floor have to go back. Maybe one day we'd like to put central heating or something like that in it. Whether they'd allow it, I don't know. Because they won't allow us to put a double glaze in it. As I walk down the side of the valley, I confront the steep slope I have to climb on the other side. It's worth a bit of puff, of course. It's exhilarating up here. And after a climb, you feel you've broken free of gravity itself. The first glimpse of the Vale of Uis and the River Honvi flowing through it. And there's my target, the village of Kum Yoy, and its delightful and slightly comical church with its leaning tower. Like a cartoon church, all askew. The land slid beneath it, but the walls clung to each other for dear life and kept standing. There's not a right angle in the place. The memorial says, Thomas Price, he takes his nap in our common mother lap, waiting to hear the bridegroom say, awake, my dear, and come away. No one knows where this came from. Though the cross has been dated as medieval, there are certain characteristics which are untypical of medieval posture, say, of the corpus. So it's possible we're seeing something as old as a pre-conquest bit of carving, which of course makes it very unique in Wales. In 1967, the cross was stolen. And by chance, one of the congregation recognized it in a London antique shop. And when it came back into the church, the church wardens cemented it firmly down in a huge block of concrete, so <laughs> it can't be taken again. In this border landscape, you have a sense of history leaking out of the seams. The ruined farmhouses in the Vale of Uis tell their story of settlement, of progress and retreat. People often took the stones from long dead buildings and recycled them in their own. This one has a rather fine doorway that was taken from a ruined ecclesiastical building, perhaps Flantoni itself. A bit of hard work climbing towards the top of Hatterall Hill, but there's no better place for the first grandstand view of Clantoni and the hills that enfold it like great arms. For more than a thousand years, this place has haunted the imaginations of dreamers and hermits and priests, poets and dropouts who followed the rainbow believing that here was paradise. But they found that even in paradise, there's a garden rake waiting to be stepped on. And first, you have to find the way. They say that up here on Hatterall Hill on a misty day, two spirits wait for the lonely traveler. One tells him the right way to go, the other tells him the wrong way. Trouble is, you never know which is which. Up on the top, you have a real sense of the people who were here in ancient times, the Iron Age people who built their forts here. But no, this isn't an Iron Age sentry box. It's a grouse butt, late 20th century. 
This is more like it, a wall built by our Iron Age ancestors. With the whooshing wind so strong up here, they must have shouted at each other all the time. Now I'm on top of the mountain wall, looking out over the plump, well-fed orchard shires of England towards the Golden Valley. Flantoni monks spent some of their time here, for life in their Welsh Arcadia was not entirely idyllic. Their Welsh neighbours were as pesky as midges, and there wasn't even a decent brewery. Over the years, their incessant, thirsty journeys cut a groove in the mountainside, and to this day it's known as the Beer Path. And that's it, over there, cutting a diagonal down the mountain. And that's the way I'm going down into the valley. Along this rocky path went the monks. What a sweat to get a pint. They certainly earned their drink. The trees around here are one of the chief glories of the Vale of Uis. They stand and bow like stately courtiers. And you feel they were planted with a purpose to grace a grand estate, and so they were. This house was meant to be a mansion, and its owner, the poet Walter Savage Landor, ah, how he'd fallen in love with Clantoni, saw it as a spiritual retreat, his corner of heaven. But even paradise has prickles. Landor was a cantankerous fellow who soon quarreled with his neighbors and was up to his ears in debts and arguments and lawsuits. He once grew so angry with his Welsh butler that he picked the man up and threw him through a window and while he was in midair, shouted, and don't land on the flowers. Landor eventually went to live in Italy where he died at the age of 90, still in a temper. Poor old Landor complained that even the Flantoni nightingales spoiled his sleep. With its silhouettes and fallen stones, Fantoni has a proper melancholic beauty, the Abbey of Ruined Dreams. The very first person that came to the valley as a hermit, William de Lacy, who had been a knight, came specifically to get away from the world. He'd fought in the wars for many years. And then he came across the place where he was out hunting, according to Gerald of Wales, and fell in love with its remoteness. But in the end, the monks grew fed up with their Welsh neighbours, packed their books and went to Gloucester. There's always a flip side to paradise, of course, and one of the other themes that comes out is that people have quite often had trouble with local people not being as keen on their presence as they are to be there. So that in, for instance, in, when the monks were at the Priory in the Middle Ages, uh, whenever the Welsh rose up in revolt, the first thing the local people did was go and attack the monastery, which is why after 1135 they left briefly to go to Hereford and then set up a much safer monastery at Gloucester, San Tony Secunda, of course, and in the end, they decided they were much more comfortable there and kept Fantoni Priory as a sort of summer retreat when the weather and the locals were more clement. In 1870, that delightful and occasionally pompous young curate, the Reverend Francis Kilvert, was here in Fantoni and saw to his horror two tourists, one of them pointing out the sights with a stick as he told his diary later, if there's one thing more hateful than another, it's being told what to admire and having objects pointed out to one with a stick. Of all noxious animals, the most noxious is a tourist. And of all tourists, the most vulgar, ill-bred, offensive and loathsome is the British tourist. Kilvert then went over there to the Abbey Hotel for some lunch and I shall be joining him in spirit. On that day, as he told his diary, he and a single companion consumed 18 hard-boiled eggs and a proportionate amount of bread, cheese, butter and beer. I shall be having something a little more moderate. This thief is pinching my toasted cheese. Definitely a Welsh blackbird. All the news that's fit to print is in the Valley Views newspaper. The founder, editor, and chief reporter is also the paperboy. This time, it's a, it's a pretty good issue, you see, because it's 10 years old this year, at this time. So this is a 10th anniversary issue. And look, we've given them an extra page. Three pages instead of two, which is really big stuff. 
Rain, storms, dogs. The news has to get through. The WI? Ah, in 1950s? Wonderful picture. Look at those evocative cardigans. Aren't they superb? Everybody wore one then. What else is in there? Well, of course, the three new babies. And that's one of the most important things. Everybody looks at the back page because that's where the gossip is, you see. Although, actually, there isn't really any gossip in this valley. It's a very strange thing. There's a good grapevine. goes from top to bottom in no time. You can't get away with anything. But people think good of people. It's a very strange thing here. It's not like where I come from in Kent at all, I can assure you. Down the years, people have found a magical, even a metaphysical quality in this valley. Those who live here see an undoubted majesty in the brooding hills. But it can be a hard place to work, and you have to come to terms with its inaccessibility and ruggedness. Everyone is a neighbour. It doesn't matter whether they're next door. My next door neighbour is a mile down the road. Whether it's next door or ten miles down, they're all neighbours. Life's quite well, a lot of different to what it used to be. Uh, at this time of year, you'd be looking forward to the shearing. And now, these days, they want it done as quick as they can. Everything's more commercialised. We used to have day shearing when one neighbour would go and help another. It'd be perhaps our day on the Wednesday, our neighbour's day on Thursday and Friday and so on and so on. And we'd all go from barn to barn. And, you know, you'd do the shearing, uh, have a bit of separate night, jokes, God knows what had happened before you went home, right? But, but that's all gone. From a distance, it can look a picture, and the further back you are, the more romantic it seems. Poets, of course, talk of the rhythm of the countryside, not its relentlessness. In winter, it can be pitiless. The sheep always demand attention, and looking after them is a tough, unremitting life that fewer young men want to take to. Up there, you can't, you, you can't, you can either walk or ride a pony, you can't take a, you can't take a bike, you can't take a four-wheel vehicle. If you're all right on the top, you can skim around every semester, but when you come on the side, you, you either have the pony or you walk. If you can earn a living sitting on a tractor, what the hell are you want running up around that mountain for? We used to have a bus once a week from uh, Abergavenny to Capilifine, and we used to have a baker twice a week, and we used to have a mobile shop come up once a week. Now we have none of those things, so nothing at all now. And um, we have to go to either Hay on Wye, which is seven miles north, or Abergavenny, 16 miles south. Until the age of the dish, this was one of the last places in Britain without television. We just have the television aerial in the top of a tree. And if you wanted a certain picture, you went out up the tree, turned the aerial around to wherever you could get that. Right, you wanted to watch something else, back down out up the tree, turn the area around somewhere else, oh, it was murder, and it was a lot of snow, it was only half a picture after. It gets a bit bleak sometimes in the winter, I must say, but um, no, it's, it's a beautiful place, and I wouldn't really want to live anywhere else. Of all the retreats that men built in their imagined Shangri-La, this one at Capilafine was one of the most remarkable. A monastery founded in 1870 by Father Ignatius, a fiery and charismatic preacher, a holy fool no bishop dare ordain. It once buzzed with religious fervor. Now the bees have the ruin to themselves. Crowds used to swarm to Father Ignatius. He dreamed of recreating a medieval monastery. He wanted to, to reintroduce um, monasticism into the Anglican Communion. That was his, um, that was his, his big idea. And, um, I mean, he was disliked enormously in the, uh, by the Archbishop and, um, and so on because of it. The Holy Order founded by Father Ignatius lasted 30 years. Then the church fell down, possibly because Father Ignatius paid low wages to the builders. In the end, he got himself ordained in America and died here in Wales in 1908 lying buried among the fallen stones of his dream. In the 1920s, Eric Gill, the artist, arrived here to found a utopian commune, and he left this tribute to a handyman. 
while his friend David Jones chose the kitchen wall as a canvas for this crucifixion. This is a wonderful place. People come here always find that when they go away they can they feel rested. There, there is something yes quite magical about it. There's no doubt about that. Capelafine is the last settlement in the Mystic Valley. Its name means the chapel on the boundary, the frontier. And there's a sense here of an outpost in the stubborn mountains, where men have always found a junction between the spiritual and material. The chapel is small, half hidden. It may be that the first congregation of Baptists in Wales met here, Certainly you have a feeling that the Baptist faith in this place has very old roots. There's a simplicity. Well, I was carried in my mother's arms, and then we went to Sunday school and Christian Endeavour. And then one uh, evening in 1946, on October the 20th, um, there was an evangelist, David Grano, was preaching and uh, I was convicted of my sin and felt my need of a saviour and I was uh, converted that evening with my heart to God and then I was baptised in the river on the, on the following June, on the 8th of June. Sometimes we have a struggle to keep the chapel door open, you know. And how do you feel about that? Well, we're just hoping there will come a revival, you know. And uh, we have to manage on supplies. We haven't a regular minister now. Do you, do you think there will be a revival? Well, it'll be lovely if it did. Remember my mother talking about the Evan Roberts revival? She went with her father to Swansea, and she said the miners were coming about the pits and they were singing hymns all up the street. It was lovely. Lovely to hear it, she said. That would be 1903 or four, I expect, wouldn't it? The farm that she and her husband work is the highest in the valley. A rugged existence. It takes a certain kind of spirit. What's the best thing about living here? Well, the animals, I think. I love them. <laughs> yes, I love the animals. She plays the organ in the church as well as the chapel and lives in a long tradition of strict religious observance. In memory of Noah, the son of Noah Watkins, who died December the 11th, 1738, aged eight years. This child said he would not take a hundred pounds in money for breaking the Sabbath, but keep it holy. The church is almost defiant, short and stout, and surrounded by seven yew trees gathered round like protective brothers. No wonder this valley has always been such a magnet. Even today it conveys the feeling of a hidden place, so that every newcomer believes himself a discoverer. And so I finish my walk here, another of God's little stepping stones in a secret valley that some men thought was Shangri-La. I've been enchanted too, but I think I've misread my map. Shangri-La's a bit further north or south, some way from here. Join me next week. I'll be walking the coast of Cardigan. And that's next Monday at 7 o'clock.